This screencast has to do with neurotransmitters and um, basically what they can do, the effects that they have, um, and then also we're going to take a look at uh, how certain drugs can mimic neurotransmitters and how they can kind of alter um, the way that things are occurring in the brain. So let's take a look here. Uh, First of all, in your textbook, if you do not have your textbook, uh, try and get it now. Pause this screencast and take a look at pages 52 and 53 in Myers Chapter 2. When you have that, then continue with this uh, broadcast. Now, when you're looking at pages 52 and 53, uh, when you read through that, it talks a lot about what's going on in terms of the neurotransmitters. Remember that when we talk about a neurotransmitter, basically what we're talking about is a chemical. And in this picture, if you, rep, if you think of this, uh, maybe one uh, area here representing the uh, terminal boutin of one uh, neuron that you know, basically is the, at the end of an axon and it's sending a chemical message through the synapse, this little gap here is called the synapse, and these chemicals are being sent to the dendrites, the receiving dendrites of the next neuron. And it's this chemical composition and what takes place in that synaptic gap. That's what we're basically looking at here. Okay. Now, if you'll notice, there's, uh, there's basically on page 52, down there at the bottom, talks how, about how different neurotransmitters, in other words, different chemicals, have different pathways in the brain. In other words, they affect different areas of the brain, and that's why we can look at the chart on page 53, and you'll notice that basically if there's, for example, too much or too little of a particular chemical or neurotransmitter, then it can have differing effects upon the brain. Uh, nowadays we have found research-wise that almost all of mental disorders have something to do with a problem in the brain either in the chemical composition of the brain or in some structure within the brain. But uh, things like schizophrenia and, and depression and things like that are, are very common that uh, we now know without a doubt have to do with the, the chemical uh, neurotransmitters that are taking place in the brain. Let's take a look. Um, we, there are literally hundreds of chemicals that have now been kind of found to be considered neurotransmitters that act in the brain. We're only going to take a look at like four of them and then we're going to talk about how drugs can kind of mimic some of those neurotransmitters. Now, acetylcholine, that's the first one we'll take a look at. You can see here, uh, basically, it affects motor movement, it affects memory, and it affects learning. And it does so by having an impact on the, the processing speed within the brain. If you look at the bottom of this particular slide, okay? The bottom of this slide talks about how fast that the brain tends to process information. And essentially, if the brain goes too fast, certain things can happen. If it goes too slow, other things, you know, problems can occur. So acetylcholine has to do with that processing speed. If there's too much acetylcholine in the brain, then it can literally lead to feelings of paranoia. If there's too little, it can create problems in terms of forgetfulness, disorganization, attention deficit issues, and the lack of acetylcholine has also been linked to Alzheimer's disease. So um, that's, you know, there's quite a few things that that one particular neurotransmitter has to, uh, or is involved in. Let's take a look at uh, another one that, again, a very common thing that you hear about is dopamine. Now, dopamine, again, has to do with movement, has to do with alertness. Um, lack of dopamine 
produces the tremors and has also been linked to Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease where people uh, literally have the tremors and they have uh, difficulty with body movements. Uh, Muhammad Ali is uh, a ve very famous case of somebody with uh, Parkinson's disease. Um, too much dopamine can actually lead to schizophrenia. That's an issue involved, you know, we found that most people who uh, have schizophrenia tend to have too much dopamine in certain areas of the brain. And so it literally can involve uh, their feelings of, uh, again, like, you know, um, the hallucinations and delusions and things like that that's involved in schizophrenia. Let's take a look at serotonin. Now, serotonin uh, is very much involved in mood control. Uh, also has impacts on hunger, sleep, and arousal, but uh, we tend to think of it a lot in terms of mood because uh, it's been linked to clinical depression. Lack of serotonin levels. Okay, if the brain doesn't get enough serotonin, basically it, it goes into a depressed state. Uh, in fact, that's what a lot of antidepressants, okay, drugs uh, that people take for depression, they try to raise those levels of serotonin. And they do it in a variety of ways. It just depends on what type of drug or which drug that you're referring to. Now, let's talk a little bit about it. And, and if you take a look again at page 52, let's take a look at how, uh, whoops, take that back. Let's go on to one more um, neurotransmitter. I, I forgot that I also had endorphins in here. Endorphins actually refers to several different uh, chemicals uh, or several different uh, neurotransmitters. But basically endorphins are involved in pain control. Um, when you get hurt, when somebody gets injured, uh, the endorphins are our body's natural morphine. Um, if you've ever seen somebody who's suffered a, a very traumatic or very serious injury, and yet it seems like they're so calm and they, they aren't experiencing a lot of pain. That's because right after an injury like that, uh, a lot of times our body produces so much endorphins that it's kind of like our own dose of morphine. Now, those endorphins don't last forever, so eventually the pain is going to kind of be known. But uh, at least for the time period, uh, the person doesn't experience a whole lot of pain. Um, a lot of opiates, the morphine, heroin, things like that, they, they act the same as our body's endorphins. Now, what's interesting is through all the research, they've also found that uh, endorphins, as well as the drugs that act like them, uh, opiates, they basically act on receptors in the brain. So, for example, when you take Tylenol, for a headache, that Tylenol doesn't know exactly where to go in your body, but it acts within the brain to reduce the headache. Um, if you have, you know, a sore knee, you might take Tylenol or, uh, you know, whatever, okay, again, some kind of painkiller. That painkiller, that Tylenol doesn't know that it's your knee that's hurting, and it doesn't matter because what it does, it, it affects certain receptors in the brain. And the brain is where we actually uh, experience the perception of pain. Okay, so that's how that kind of works. Now, let's go back and let's take a look at uh, how that all this can also be mimicked with various drugs and how different drugs actually uh, kind of act like neurotransmitters. Um, If we, uh, if we put drugs in, in three categories, basically drugs can be what we call agonist. Uh, they basically simulate particular neurotransmitters that cause neurons to fire. So an agonist type drug is going to increase the activity level or the firing level of particular neurons. 
antagonist, antagonist are going to stop or prevent or slow down the neural firing. So those are two different ways that drugs can kind of impact. And basically they're, they're affecting the synapse, the little gap between um, the neurons. And they're, they're either preventing a neuron from firing or they're increasing the ability of that neuron to fire. Now, one other thing that we talk about or that takes place here is something called reuptake. Now, it's kind of interesting because um, when we talk about reuptake, usually when a neuron fires, it releases a chemical into a synapse, and then if there's enough of that chemical that binds to the next neuron, then that neuron fires and goes on. Oh, the message gets sent. But once that that's done, okay, there's a certain amount of the chemical or a certain amount of the neurotransmitter that is left in that synaptic gap, in that little bitty tiny microscopic space between the two neurons. And what happens is that the original neuron that sent the message will reuptake that excess chemical. In other words, it'll kind of reabsorb it. Okay, think of it as kind of, it's almost like a conservation thing. It, it will see that, okay, there's a whole bunch of that chemical that's left in the synapse. It'll reabsorb it so that it can then use it again in the future. Well, some drugs act as reuptake inhibitors. In other words, what they do is they block the ability of the sending neuron to reuptake the excess of that neurotransmitter. Now, if you think through that, what that means is if the reuptake doesn't take place, that means there's more of that neurotransmitter within the synapse and it stays there for a longer time period. And so it's going to be more likely to continuously send messages with that next neuron. A lot of antidepressant drugs act in that way. So again, drugs can mimic what the neurotransmitters are doing and that's where um, a lot of knowledge has been gained in the last 30 years or so in terms of how the brain works, the types of neurotransmitters that are being sent uh, within the brain and then creating different imitation drugs that simulate those particular neurotransmitters. That's a, it's a huge area within the, the area of new neuroscience today.